Jesus, we bring again needs to you. You're the source of all supply, spiritual, physical, emotional, financial, whatever, Lord. And all these needs are in here and have been placed by faith through a loving heart and hands. And Lord, we bless them in your name and we lift them to you for answers. You are the source. We're just a vehicle saying, here they are, Jesus, these dear ones in need, and we want to stand in prayer with you as you pray before the Father for us all. For we're told that you ever live to make intercession for us. So we join in your life's work where you are now in intercession as we lift these loved ones to you. And we thank you tonight for the answers. Amen. <coughs> When Uncle Jack was talking, I thought, I'm going to add one sentence to that when I get up there. I'm going to say, don't try to convert your preacher to CFO when you go home. <laughs> there have been more ministers made mad <laughs> and turned against CFO, and they don't know a thing about it. They've never been there. Somebody goes home, and they, they don't mean it. You know, I, don't, I probably did it. I can't remember. It's been so long since I went to my first one. But you see, they feel talked down to. You hear somebody in their parish or their church tell them how, and don't do it. <clears throat> Glenn Clark said that going to CFO made you a better church member. Just go home and be what you've learned to be this week. And he may ask you what. And you just say, I just walked, found a deeper walk in Jesus. And just let him watch and wonder what happened. As he keeps asking questions, if he does, well, then you may be able to share. But just take a fool's advice and don't go down and tell him right off where you've been and all that happened. And, and so he'll really think you're weird if you tell him everything that's happened up here that we take for granted. Okay, Uncle Jack, I just thought I'd add that to your talk. Where is he? I want you to know... I've got an angel, not on my shoulder, but it's almost. Earlene fixed this for me today, and this morning I was given another angel by, the, the two angels have given me angels today. Doris gave me one in a wreath, and uh, sharing with two friends at noon, I began to feel that I should share a bit about angels tonight, and I didn't bring anything, and I worked all afternoon trying to get what I could think about, remember, and my little this little Bible, it's just worn out and marked and torn, and it doesn't have much concordance in it. It wasn't much help. So with the help of the Lord, I'm going to try to share, and I am very time conscious usually, but I'm, I may run over a little bit tonight because it's very difficult to get what I want to say, and I'm just giving you a part of it t tonight as God leads me. Um, the church is poorer because it has not taught the ministry of angels. I say that of all the churches. The English, I mean the uh, Episcopal Church and the Roman Catholics have kept angelology alive down through. And most of the rest of them haven't. I never heard anybody talk about angels. And when I was a little girl and on up till I was a mother, I never thought of angels except guardian angels. And I kept in contact with them. I remember the first day that each of my little boys went to school. I sent the guardian angels with them. And I continued to do that more or less through the years. And when they went overseas, certainly. And when I'd get on in uh, certain vehicles with some drivers, you know, I'd contact that <laughs> guardian angel. I was with a nephew and his wife one night. And some of you have heard me tell this, Dot and Tom and and I don't know who else, maybe Daisy and, and Paul, but, and Joyce. Anyway, um, he was making about 80 or 85 miles an hour going from Waco to Fort Worth. And his wife said, Billy, you're going to scare Ted to death. That's my name in the family. And he just kept driving, and my husband was about to have a fit. He was getting scared. We were in the back seat, of course. And Billy said, I'm all right. Nothing will happen to this car if Aunt Ted's in it. I said, Billy, they tell me that the guardian angel steps out at 65. 
so I did, did know something about guardian angels. You know, I was so narrow, and my mold was so set about angels, I thought, if I ever thought about it, I thought, well, I'm in the age of grace, and I'm in the age of the Holy Spirit dispensation, and I don't need angels. I have the Holy Spirit. Didn't have much up here about them, angels, or I wouldn't have ever settled for that. That's where most of us were, and that's where I was. And a friend of mine went to hear a preacher preach. She's a good Southern Baptist that's been, what do you call it, tampered with. <laughs> she'd been, she'd come into a deeper walk with the Lord. And she went to hear a preacher, and I didn't go with her, and she's telling me about it. She said, Thelma, you should have heard that man. He was telling about praying for his finances, said he was always having financial trouble. And the Lord spoke to him, and he said, my son, you haven't used what I've given you. And he said, what do you mean, Lord? And the Lord spoke to him two, ser two sermons, two scriptures. Psalm 91, 11, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Well, I thought, I guess that does include your finances. Well, then the other scripture was Hebrews 1, 13 and 14, where he's speaking of angels, and he's, Paul said, Are they not all ministering spirits sent to minister for those? Not to those, but for those who should be heirs of salvation. Are you an heir of salvation? Amen. I am too. But they weren't ministering for me because I didn't put them to work. I didn't give them anything to do. And about 1968, I guess, I, she told me this. That hadn't been very long ago. And I thought, angels, now listen here. Then I went to a, a, a Northern California CFO and I was speaking, and one afternoon, as I walked down to the dining room, a woman stopped me, or called me, and says, Thelma, wait a minute, I want to tell you something. And we were walking along, and she put her arm around me, and she said, this morning when you were speaking, I wanted to tell you, I saw a half circle of angels around you, and I thought, oh, brother, that one of those women, I'm sure going to leave her alone. You know, I just checked her off as weird, and, and it should have thrilled me. You see where I was, how close my mind was to something that has proved to be so important and so profitable and so transforming is the word. It didn't only change my life, it transformed it. And so that's the way I reacted. But when Buna came back and told me that this man said that from that day forward, he'd never had to pray over his finances. Now, this was in the 70s, about 10 years after my experience with this woman that said, she saw those angels. And so I went to reading. Now, I, I don't accept what I hear unless I can find it in this. Amen. That's my God. It's the only one I know that's, that's faultless and steadfast and I can depend on it. And this is the only eternal thing I can hold in my hand in this world right there. Not this copy. It'll wear out. It's already worn out, but I'm still carrying it. But uh, I believe that there is guidance in the Bible for me and for everybody else. So I go to the Word. So I went to the, I went to the Bible. I said, Lord, I, I don't understand this. If that, I sure could use some help financially. My husband uh, had passed away, and his mother had been... Uh, ill with cancer for 10 years, and we had helped as much as we could with her hospital bills and doctor bills, and, and my husband was sick for two years. That was, that is, he was unemployed those two years. He was not sick in bed until the last two months. But our savings had just dwindled and dwindled and dwindled. And I found myself in a situation that could have been... Uh, 15 or 20 years earlier, it would have worried me to death, would have kept me awake at night. But the Lord was gracious. I wasn't, I wasn't really worrying, but I, so, I told the Lord, I said, I need another $100 a month after I heard this about this report. And I'm going to try and see if it'll work. I need another $100 a month to have money to share and do what I need to do and what I'd like to do. And so I read the word. And I read, and I read for three years before I ever spoke on angels. Billy Graham book hadn't come out, none of these others. I read some things that I could find. Some of it I threw away. But this is what I discovered, friends, as well, if my memory's correct. 
I discovered that angels are mentioned or referred to 118 times in the Old Testament. There are 39 books, and the Psalms has 150 chapters. There are 27 books in the New Testament, and some of them just have one chapter, and they're mentioned or alluded to 165 times in the New Testament. That was an eye-opener. And I also was aware, now I'd read the Bible and been trying to teach it. I told you I've been trying to teach it since I was 17 years old. I, I don't know why I didn't see that Peter needed angels. He was in the age of grace. Well, it was a gradual opening of my narrow vision of what God has for us and trying to believe things that, well, I, that's, I just, that's not the way I've learned it. You know, they say the famous words in most churches, the famous seven last words, it never happened like this before. <laughs> so that's kind of where I was about angels. And uh, but as I began to read and study, I want to share with you some things. And some of these are going to be real experiences that I know about and was a part of uh, most of them. Miss, uh, angels, uh, perhaps you know this, but I didn't know it. Angels are created beings. They're not people that died, good people, and turned into angels and went to heaven. That's what I used to think when I was a, a, a little girl or a young girl. I thought when I died and went to heaven, I'd be an angel. I never had been one down here. But I thought, <laughs> I thought when I died and went to heaven, I'd be an angel. That's not true. Angels are created angels. And they're not a race of people. They're creatures created by God. And a third of them fell one time. Angels can trip and fall. And they were cast out of heaven, you know that, with, when Satan was cast out. A third of the angels went with him. I think God's heart must have grieved, but he let them go. Angels are created. Their, their nature is they're very powerful. They're very wise. They are not deity. They refused worship anywhere you hear any read it in the Bible. Sometimes people fell down to worship them, and they refused worship because they know they're not deity. They do not heal. They do not take the place of Christ in any way. Christ's atonement and his uh, propitiation for our sins and our sicknesses, Christ bore. The angels are angels. They're not deity. They're, they never die. They, uh, well, I can't remember all the things that I have at home about them, but I, that's some of, about their nature. They can come on incognito to earth and take the form of men. I never heard of a female angel. <laughs> Girls, I'm sorry, but I haven't. <laughs> but Usually they appear, you, you, it, and from Genesis through Revelation, they're it mentioned 60-something times in the book of Revelation. From, it begins in Genesis. Abraham killed an animal and served these angels, and they must have looked just like the people in his country. And they talked his language. And they ate, uh, was it a kid or a calf he killed? I believe it was a kid. And then he, he, they had bread, and he sat and talked with these two angels so they can come and take the form of man. They, ha they have a dual ministry. They are created to worship and serve God before the throne, and, and the visions that John saw of it and visions that some of them that have about to slip over to, will tell you they see the angels up there. I had an aunt when I was a little girl that died, and she told me, she said, I can't see you, honey, but don't you, I can see angels. Don't you see those angels? Well, I didn't see any angels. It kind of scared me. So they, they are worshiping God, and they do his bidding. There's no disobedience in one of them anymore. The one that were disobedience are with another captain now. They're following Satan. And so this is a bit about their nature and their ministry. So their their first, I suppose their first duty is is uh, worshiping and and uh, obeying God in heaven and and uh, doing His bidding there. But they also come earthward and minister to the body of Christ. 
God's family. That I didn't realize. In fact, I hadn't thought very much about it. I knew they sang holy, holy, and there were thousands upon ten thousands, the word said. And they're numberless. That's another thing about them. And, uh, well, these are some of the things I began to find out about. Them. I wanted to know about their nature, and etc. That's enough of that. So then I began to read in my concordance where, what they did. Well, I won't begin to tell you, but I, I did remember two scriptures that I always uh, refer to. One is in 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, verses 5 to 8. Elijah had just won a, a victory, and Je Jezebel was after him, and he'd faced the prophets of Baal and, and been through an awful battle with them and let one woman scare him so bad he went and hid from her. She must have been a sight, that woman. You know, I've heard people call somebody, some woman a Jezebel. I don't know of anything that would hurt me worse than to be called Jezebel. I, that's just worse, about the worst thing I can think of, don't you think, Ruth? To be, to be called a Jezebel. Well, he was scared of Jezebel, and he hid, and he went in a cave. No, and he was under the juniper tree when this happened. Did you ever get under the juniper tree? Well, I was under it about six weeks ago, crying out and saying, Lord, they're all gone but me. <laughs> all of my age. And, and here I am left. And, and he said, they're all gone, but me, why don't you just let me die, Lord? Well, if he had, he'd have missed going to heaven in a whirlwind if, if God had heard his answer, his prayer. But Elijah was afraid, and, and he, there weren't any cafeterias where he was, and he was hungry, and he was tired, and he was thirsty. And so God sent an angel. That's in First Kings, I gave you that. And and the angel told him to rest. You go home and read that now. I, there are two scriptures, and I may have crossed a little bit because I didn't have a note with me, bring with me. And so the angel uh, gave him drink and baked a cake, it says. And the scripture says that he arose and went 40 days in the strength of that cake. And I always have to say this, girls, wouldn't you like that recipe? <laughs> he went 40 days in the strength of that cake. Angels baked a cake for Elijah when he was in hiding and fearful. So they ministered to people. And in, in 2 Kings, in the um, 19th chapter, uh, the Assyrians, you know that story, they were coming against Israel, and Sennacherib was ready to come down, and we're coming down, and we're going to take you. And, and the prophet of God called out to God for mercy. And do you know what happened that night? God sent one angel. Now, I don't know how many people, men, were in that Assyrian army. But they had a big army, a formidable army. And one angel slew. 185,000 Assyrians one night. And he's still alive. If you get in a jam, that one angel is still around. He's still alive. They don't die. Now, this was Old Testament, but God says he doesn't change. And so, if you get in a jam, or if you don't get in a jam, I suggest you get in in touch with, now I don't see angels. I can see this one and that lovely one that's in that little wreath that Doris gave me, little white angel. And there are two up here, bowing so darling with little wings. But these angels are sent earthward to help God's people in distress. Now girls are not going to come in and make your beds. And fellas are not going to come in and fix your flat. That you can do. They meet us in our distresses when we're up against something we can't handle. And that's, that's God's purpose. And um, in the Psalm 68, 17, I found this. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. And the Lord is among them. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that encouraging? 
Well, then Psalm 34 and 7 says, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about whom? Them that fear him. him, To deliver them. And I never knew there was angels camping around my house. Did you? So I didn't rely on them. And so when I was alone at night and I was, my husband's work took him away and I, I was always a bit scared at night. I didn't know there was camped, angels camped round about me. And I'm going to share this. I know of, of the missionary to whom this happened. She was in Africa and she had an orphanage. She, she never married. She was a maiden lady. And she had, I don't know how many children. It seems to me it was 150 or 200 children in her care. And there, she didn't have her place fenced in. There was no wall or anything for protection. And there was a young couple that worked with her. And he was the only man on, in the area. And it was out from town, in, out sort of to itself. And a runner came one evening to, to alert this missionary, and he said, there are some marauders on the way, and they're killing and stealing. Oh, and she'd just gotten her rice and wheat and things to last for rainy months or something. She had quite a store of food that she brought in and said, they're looting and, and killing, and, and said, we thought you should know. Well, she had no protection, and she called the children in and this young couple, and they got down on their knees, and they prayed for divine protection. And she sat up with the couple, as I remember the story, and the children, they finally put the children to bed after prayer. The next morning, a man came to their door and knocked. He said, where are all those soldiers you had here last night? What would you do with those soldiers you had here last night? She said, what soldiers? He said, soldiers, you had hundreds of them, and every one of them had on white uniforms. I said, we came here to get in, and we couldn't get in. You see, they did encamp round about those people. And this same missionary God spoke to one time, and she was scared about, uh, I don't remember what it was. She was she had lots of challenges, you do, on the mission field. And God spoke to her and says, where are you living? Well, she said, Lord, I'm living in wherever it was in Africa. He said, just move in on 91st Street. Move in on 91st Street. Abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Isn't that good? So she did. She learned it. Now, these stories I knew, but I thought that's a missionary in Africa. That's not for me in Fort Worth, Texas. And I simply could not receive it because I hadn't ever known that and I hadn't believed it. And because my limited mind didn't know it, I discredited it. Isn't that foolish? We never learn when we live like that. Well, as I began to read and I read in Luke, an angel spoke to Elizabeth about John the Baptist. An angel came and announced the conception of Jesus to Mary and then later to Joseph and then took Joseph and Mary into Egypt. And the angels, the baby Jesus needed angels even. The Son of God needed angels. And who am I to think I didn't need angels? The angels sang the welcome chorus at the birth of Jesus. Yes, Welcomed him to earth. Just the angels. Oh, friends, I, I look back, and when I, after I'd read everything I had, and I fell down before God, and I said, God, forgive me my stupidity and my narrowness, my unopened mind, my closed mind, I think is what I said, and forgive me. And then I turned, you know, I, I live by myself and I can talk out loud if I want to. And I said to the angels, and I apologize to you. I've ignored you for all these years. And I wasn't aware that you were around and I haven't used you, but there's going to be a change made. You, we're going to work together and we're going to get things done for God. And I'm going to send you out. So I started in the mornings. And I thought, well, it's no good for me to send them out. I don't know where to tell them to go. But I started saying, God, I send your mighty angels out under your direction to bring into my hands today everything the Father has for me. Now, I had asked for an extra $100 a month. I would have settled for that and did. 
but I didn't know how he was going to do it. And so I say, I would say, bring into my hands, I charge you, angels of, of the mighty God, to bring into my hands what the Father has for me today. I don't know what, I don't want what belongs to anyone else. I just want my portion for today, but I haven't claimed my portion, and I'm claiming it. And I thank you for going forth and ministering for me. If you're ministering to me, Larry, I might not feel like directing you, but if you're ministering for me, I can tell you what to do. I guess. I'd try it anyway. So, I began to be explicit with these angels and send them out. And I want you to know that the $100 came in nothing flat every month, and within a given time it was raised, and it was raised, and it kept coming. And, and uh, somebody was talking, we were talking about clothes. I said, I hardly ever buy a garment. I have some friends in West Texas and Oklahoma, some dear Lebanese friends. They're like my family. And they get in a dress that's extra long, and it's a certain color, and they think of me, and they just box it up and send it to me. I hardly ever buy a dress. Those angels really went to work. Now, they never did that until I sent those angels out. When I'd be in their stores, they'd say, well, Maybe they'd give me something and try to get me to try on a dress. But they just box them up and send them to me now. I don't even have to try them on. They know what I can wear. Well, it, that's just a little thing. It has been such a different life for me since I send the angels out to do for myself what I can't do. And so I started out in the financial area because that was my greatest need, I thought, right then. And it began to work. It began to work, and I was so amazed. I was so amazed, but I was afraid to tell. I was afraid to tell people about angels because I knew how I felt, and I thought they'll think I'm nuts. So I kept it for a long time. I didn't even tell my son that lives there. I kept it, and I didn't want to be rebuffed, and, and I thought, I, I have discovered something, and it's so marvelous but it was three years before I ever gave a talk on angels. I ran it through my mill until I felt sure of what I was doing. And it was such a tremendous thing. Well, I'd read the Bible, you know. Did you know that the law was partly given through the disp disposition of angels? Read Acts. That's in Acts. That's Acts 5, 19. Think, yeah, angel. And... Then in Hebrews, uh, Paul tells us there, but ye are common to Mount Zion. This is Hebrew 12, 22. And unto the holy city, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. He's talking to, church, to the churches, and that's us. We spiritually have come to Mount Zion, and we're in the presence of numer innumerable angels. And I think some of them may be on dole or relief because we're not using them. That's a silly thing to say. But they're idle, maybe. We're not putting them to work. We're not getting them in, uh, into these places and doing things that we can't do. God knows what our limitations are, and he's got angels to step in where we've reached the end of our rope. And we haven't known it. The church has not preached it. I'm not condemning the church. And maybe if they had, they'd have found people like me that wouldn't have believed it, for a long time at least. I had to find out for myself before I could accept it. And if you go away from here tonight and say, Thelma Lee's off a rocker, she's up there talking about angels being around to Fort Worth, Texas, I won't feel bad a bit. <laughs> I feel sorry, but I won't feel bad. And then in Hebrews 13, we're told how to treat, the, uh, how to expect angels. He said... Be careful in entertaining strangers, for in so doing, some have entertained angels unawares. Makes me think of, what's her name, Roy Rogers' wife? Yes, her book on angels unawares. Well, Acts 12 and 7, the angels released Peter from prison. God sent an angel. God knew where Peter was, and Peter couldn't get out of those chains, and he sent an angel to let him out. This is the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. This is 7th chapter back, 12th chapter back. Well, 
Anyway, I quoted Psalm 91, 11, and Hebrews 1, 13, and 14. And you can go home and get your own concordance and look up angels and read all you want to. I don't have time, and I didn't have any more time to prepare this afternoon. I used all I had. Uh, but I want to share some experiences. When this began to happen to me, I was so excited. I was so excited. And I began, to, I was keeping a diary. I have been since 1959, so I was writing things down that were happening. And I, as I look back through those diaries the last six months for some material, I was amazed at what those angels did from 1959. No, I didn't know about that in 59, but the diaries were 59. This started about in the late six, in the 68 or something, that I began to get my eyes open to their ministry. And I began, uh, so it, it must have been in the 70s that I began to speak on angels, because I didn't for three years. So I thought, I was in um, Grand Rapids, Michigan, visiting in the home of friends, and there was a woman there, a teacher in the public schools, whose daughter was in ORU. And we were having a group meeting in a home that night, and I was speaking to them, her mother and father's home. So this girl told this story. She and her roommate left the campus at ORU one afternoon rather late to go to a little place close to get some ice cream. And if you've ever seen ORU, it's a wooded area all almost all the way around, particularly on that side where the little store was. So it was late, and they sat in there and talked and talked, and it began to get dusk. Now, where there's lots of trees, you have dusk. Where I live, we don't have dusk. It's daylight, and then, then it's dark. There are not any trees. To, but those girls were headed back to the dormitory, and as they started down that road, a car came by with two men in it, and the men stopped and asked the girls to get in, and, they'd take, and they thanked them. And so they went on around that drive that goes all around, and they saw that car coming back, and they began to pray up a storm. And they prayed, and the, the men stopped again, and I believe that was the trip. One of them said something to them that frightened them very much, and they refused to get in the car. And, and I don't know what happened then, but the car left the second time without them. Then they saw them coming back and they were deeper into the wooded area. And she said they cried out to God. And, and she, she told us, she said, you won't believe it, but I saw it. She, she said before us appeared three, foot, three men in football suits, shoulder pads, headgear, knee pads, the whole bit. Oh, are you doesn't even have a football team. Everybody knows they got a basketball team, but there's no football team there. And she said those... She said, those three fellows were walking step by step by step in front of us, just a few yards. And where they come, came from, we didn't know. And they walked in front of us. And this, when this car came back the third time, they saw those men and they went on and, and they didn't see the car anymore. And those three men in white football uniforms walked perfectly rhythmic steps till they got within very close to the dormitory and disappeared. They, she said they just disappeared. And we went in and got a bunch of the boys and girls, and we got flashlights, and we combed those woods, and they, there were no football players there. So this girl said, now, I'd never talked on angels there. I never had seen this girl before. She said, we knew it had to be three angels God sent down there to take care of us. They came as football players and protected those girls. That happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I heard the girl relate it that was in, that was in the experience. Um, so many things have happened that I, I want to share. Uh, I have some friends in California. She's now with the Lord, and they had a thriving cleaning and pressing business in Whittier. And good Methodist, tied, loved the Lord, and that was my home away from home when I was in Southern California. They had a room they called Thelma's Room. So it was just, they were such comfortable, wonderful friends, and, and I just loved my time with them. So I was out there this time, and, and John said to me, Thelma, we need prayer. He said, the, this was when the drip dries in um, 
all those things began to come on, you know. And he said, our life savings is in this business, and we've had a good business. But he says, it's going down to we've had to let one person go and put another one on half time. And, and my wife is having to go down there two or three times a week in the afternoon and work and stand on her feet. And he said, if it goes on like this, we could lose every dollar we've got. Well, I studied a little bit. I didn't have much boldness then about talking about angels. I said, John, you and Elizabeth believe in angels? And they said, yes. And I believed them. So I told them about my finances and what was happening in my life. I said, would you like for me to pray and send God's angels out here in Whittier? And they said, yes. So the three of us joined hands. We prayed. And I began to pray for that golden gate, golden something cleaners. I forgot the name. And I thanked God for sending his angels to Whittier to bring into that shop everything that, that belonged to them, their portion of the business. He, he had said, everybody's having problems. And I said, God, I don't ask you to take business from another one. Just bring to them all that's theirs. And we send those angels out under your direction to bring business into these children. They belong to you, Lord. And I thanked them. And I told them, I said, thank the angels, whether you uh, uh, really are sure. And I started giving thanks to the angels in the evening. If, whether I saw results or whether I didn't, I would thank anybody else that I'd sent out to help me that day. And I thanked them for their, and I still do. If I'm not too sleepy, I thank the angels for their protection and their help through the day. So we prayed. I came home. Oh, no. I went to, up to Santa Barbara and was gone about a week up in that area. I came back down <clears throat> this, to their house, and the door was open, so I knew somebody was there, and I just went on in and uh, called out and said something. And he says, come back here, Thelma. And I went back there, and he was stretched out on a lazy boy with an ottoman on his, under his feet. And he said, Thelma, you're going to have to talk to those angels. They're working us to death. <laughs> he said, I've had to put that other woman that was on half time back up work, work. I said, are you complaining? <laughs> Do you know, he said they had $2,000 worth of, of drapes brought in that in just a few days from uh, some apartments they didn't ever, had never had business from before. Now, friends, that happened to some friends of mine. I was there, and I know it happened. I'm not telling you a tale, a so tale. That's what you call it in Virginia. Well, uh, I was in Vernon, Texas, a uh, guest in the home of these Baptist friends. He's a banker, retired now. And I was speaking there, and uh, we came in from the church at noon Saturday, and and he was there, and he was white and pale. He said, Joan, have you seen my billfold? Well, you know what a woman will say. Where did you have it? Well, isn't that just like him? Well, she, he said, I don't know. He said, I've been out to the, he had 15 acres out the edge of Vernon. He'd been raised on the farm. They had a lovely home, but he just loved to go out there Saturday afternoon. Their bank stayed open Saturday morning. And plow in the afternoon and relax. He had on a jumpsuit. And he said, if I've plowed it under, it's in shreds. He, she said, how much did you have in it? And he's a very frugal man. But the girls that closed the safe closed it before he got $700 in there that he meant to put in there on Saturday morning. And there he was with $700 in his billfold. And he'd lost it. And so two friends were taking me to lunch at the club. And, and uh, Joan said, where did you have it last? Well, he said, I don't really know. Well, she said, let's go out there. She said, let me get on a pair of jeans and let's get two rakes and go out there. And he said, and rake 15 acres? <laughs> so I'm standing in the hall and I look at R.B. and I said, R.B., I knew I could tell Joan Angel that she'd believe it because she's like my child and loves me like a mother. But I wasn't sure about him. I said, R.B., do you believe in angels? He said, yeah. Just like that. Yeah. Not too convincing, but he didn't say no. And so I told him about my, my help from God through the ministry of angels. And, what, and he knows me. He's known me a long time. And he knows that 
that I wouldn't have told it if it hadn't been true. He says, sure. And the three of us stood there, and I said, you want me to pray and send God's angels to take care of that billfold? He said, yes. So we, we joined hands in that hall, and we prayed, and I sent those angels out to return that billfold and to protect it from the hands of any person until R.B. got back out there. And I thank God for the angels protecting it and bringing it back, retrieving it. And I went on to the club with these two friends, and we'd been there about 20 minutes, and we'd ordered, and I was waiting. We were waiting for our meal, and I was paid on the phone. And Joan was laughing and crying at the same time. She said, Thelma, R.B. drove right to that place, got out of the car, and it was on top of the ground, untouched, and every dime was in it that was in it. He gave me $50. <laughs> Pays off sometimes. <laughs> okay. Now you say that's providence. Maybe so, but it didn't happen to me till I got the angels on, on my list and uh, in my employ. Do you know that God loves you enough to send you angels to to be employed by you and you have hey, maybe you haven't been asking them to do a thing? Well, that's where I was. And oh, when I got my eyes open, it was the most exciting thing. It was the most exciting thing. There's a story. Now, I got this in Canada, in Ontario. And the woman with whom I, with whom I was visiting had a friend who was a sister of the woman, that I'm, the family I'm talking about, that lived in Warsaw, Poland. He was an itinerant minister. It was the, day, it was the days of the war. World War One, I, I guess. Hitler was that World War One or two? <laughs> uh, and, and this man was in the Ukraine, and he had a little car and was traveling around, no contact with home. And they owned a bakery in Warsaw, and there were 15 people in his family, counting his children and grandchildren. And he was he would be gone weeks at a time. And God spoke to this man and said, "Go home." Well, he thought somebody was really sick at home or something bad. So he, he said, Lord, I'm not through with my ministry. Well, the Lord spoke. He said, go home. So he went home, and he got home, and his family was all well, and he prayed. He said, God, I don't understand it. I wasn't through with my circuit or whatever he called it, and my family's all right. Why did you bring me home? And in his time with God, God began to speak to him. He said, I want you to get sell your car your bakery, your home, convert it into cash, buy a wagon with two teens, and fill that wagon with loose hay. you got to walk pretty close to God to get explicit orders like that. This man got it. And he said, in that hay, I want you to put staples that can be opened and eaten, and an extra warm outfit for everybody in your family. And I'll tell you when to leave. You are to leave. Now, that's a big order, isn't it? That is a big order. So the man sold everything, got the wagon, put the hay in it, got the clothes in it, and he waited, waited, and I, I've forgotten the time, so I don't know about that. It seems to me like it was 10 days or something like that. And one morning around 2 a.m., it was like a big hand hit him on the shoulder and said, you have to leave now and get your family into that hay and drive, uh, you, you be the only one visible and start driving. He, and he said, God, I don't know where to go. He said, go toward the forest. And that man got in that wagon, his family hidden in the hay, which was also warming, I suppose. Never rode in hay un, under it, but anyway, that was the year, days before allergies and they got in the hay and rode. <laughs> <laughs> and they rode until nearly daybreak. And a man in a brown uniform appeared at the head of the first team of horses and stood there with, a, I don't know what he had, a, is it a bridle on a horse's head? He touched the horse. And this minister became frightened because he said Hitler's henchmen wore brown uniform. And this man spoke to him, and uh, the minister said, Just a minute, please, sir. And he got out and went around the wagon, and he said, God, is this a man that you've sent to us, or is this one of Hitler's henchmen? And God said, You can trust him. I sent him. 
And every morning, they would go into hiding somewhere. And this brown, the man in brown would walk ahead of the horses and lead them. And they'd hide for the day. Then they'd travel at night. And every morning at a given time, this man appeared. And then when he got through, when it was time for them to rest, he disappeared. They didn't see him. This went on for days. And then finally one day, they came into a clearing, and it was a refugee camp. And this man said, you'll be safe in there. And they were saved. And the night they left Poland was the night that Hitler's hordes came down and ravished the city. This, I didn't know their names, but I, I got it home, but I've forgotten it now. But that happened to a family that my friend in Ontario knows. And they said, we are convinced that God sent that man, an angel in disguise, to lead us every night and take care of us and help us to hide during the day. And they got out of Poland. <clears throat> Isn't that amazing? It's very amazing. I've got a friend that was interviewed in CBN a few years ago. When did we have the annual at Hampton, Virginia? How long ago? About eight years, About seven 79. years? 79. And uh, they took a busload of us over there from uh, the annual to CBN. And it was in that small building they had first, and they could only seat 42 or 3, and that's what was on the bus. We got there, and there sat a woman. I sat right there that I've known for 20 years from Lubbock, Texas. And her husband was being interviewed, and he's an oil man. And uh, uh, I can't tell you his name, but that's all right. I know him. I've known him for quite a while. And so he and his friend were in partnership. They owned a plane, and they were scouting around in Arkansas over the Ozark Mountains. And they looked, and they were about out of gas. And they're over some mountains in Arkansas, no place to land. They began to pray. They prayed up a storm. Now, he told this on the television. Some of you may have seen, seen this and heard it. And they began to pray for a place to land. They had to get down, or they would crash. And they, sp they spotted a a farm with white fence all the way around it, which looked like it was not a large plane, just a private plane, and that they could land there with ease, as, any, as easy as they could land anywhere. So they headed for this place to land. They landed with no problem at all, just came down in that lot, pasture, whatever it was. And they started up to the house to ask to use a telephone to call the nearest airport to bring them some gas. And this man came out and met them. He said, are you all right? They said, yes, we're fine. We're just fine. He said, how about that other man? He said, there's not another man. He said, don't tell me there's not a man. You don't see a man riding on the wing of a plane and landing very often. And there was a man on that plane on the wing when you landed. I saw him. <laughs> well, this fellow said, God sent one of his angels. And he rode that plane down with us and nothing happened. Now, I know that man, even though I can't tell you his name, precious CFO. That's where I met him, he and his wife. And I'm sitting right by her and just patting her knee and laughing. It was the, see, I had no idea who they'd be interviewing, but it was somebody I knew. I know I should stop. But I don't want to. Uh, I had a friend, I was sharing this today with a couple here. At 55, an engineer, he'd given his entire life to General Dynamics. And if you've been reading about General Dynamics in, in Fort Worth, you know there's been some shenanigans pulled there that cost the government an awful lot of money. Yeah. Something that 110 or $12 that they could buy for six or seven and something like that. This friend of mine was a member of our church. He's German, very, very, uh, got a mind of his own, very, uh, a man full of integrity. Now, he was christened in that church. I don't know if he knew Jesus then or not. I didn't question him. But he came to church most of the time, and his wife was a very great worker there. And he'd given his life to General Dynamics. And some things happened. I won't go into detail. And he got fired, and it nearly killed him. Well, since then, they've tried their best to get him back over there to tell. And he says, I don't want anything to do with that mess. And he didn't go. Well, anyway, because he didn't play ball with some people that were into this, he got fired. And they trumped 
something up that was two offices down and fired Ben. And I was in Europe. And when I got back, a mutual friend says, have you talked to Ben? And I said, oh. She said, he's been trying to call you. I said, tell me he's in such trouble, he's nearly crazy. And so I called him, and they came over, and he told me his story. And he wept. He's about the age of my first son. He just wept, and I couldn't stand it. I just, I just went, my heart went out to him. He said, Thelma, I'm 55 years old, and that's all I know. Where can I go get a job? And he was just desperate. And I looked at him and Phyllis, and I said, Ben, do you believe in angels? And he said he did. And so I said, God loves you and knows where you are. And if you want me to pray, I'm going to send those angels out and open the door for you. God knows your situation, and there's angels at your disposal. And they can go into offices and put things together that we can't do. And I said, would you like me to pray? I'd never prayed with them separately. That's just not done much in that church. Well, it's better now in that respect. And so we joined hands and prayed, and I sent God's angels out to open doors for Ben that he never dreamed of, and that he knew the company where he could give service in, in return, and he would fill a need in a company, and at the same time, their needs would be met and he would be employed. God never takes away from me to bless you, Evelyn. He doesn't have to do that. He's limitless. And so we sent the angels out. I left town again. And he was called, he went up to Lubbock, where his son was with an oil company, brilliant boy, I think he's a geologist. And so he got his dad introduced to some oil men up there, and they kind of put him out on some lease, lease work, lease, land lease work for oil. And he worked a little up there, and he didn't, hadn't had any experience hardly. And I don't know, and he doesn't know what happened, but he got a call from Mississippi, and they wanted to know if he could come down there. They'd pay him $100 a day. Now, this has been, oh, goodness, I don't know how many years. About eight or ten. $100 a day was a lot of money for somebody that didn't know any more about what he was doing than Ben did. And he said, we'll pay you $100 a day for six months, and we want you to come down here in Mississippi. Well, during this time, Ben was getting up at 5 and 5.30 in the morning and reading the Word of God. And he began to grow like Topsy. I tell you, he just grew and he grew and he grew in the Lord. And the, he began devouring God's Word. He'd never read the Bible, he said. And he and Phyllis began to pray and they began to walk together and they began to send those angels out. Well, when that assignment was over, he got another one and another one and another one. He was making more money than he'd ever made in his life and witnessing the people in he went first one town in one state. He went to Louisiana. He went to East Texas. He went to North Texas. And he was working and telling people how God answered prayer and that they had angels they could send out if they got in a jam and needed help. And he told his story. He's now on, I have a corporation board, and he's now on my board and a very faithful friend and supporter. And do you know, you'd never make Ben Fay, that's his name, Ben Fay believe that there isn't help in angels. And he hasn't had to work. Now, the oil business has hit a slump, but he's retired. And he's just happy. He just loves the Lord, and we get together. It's like a different couple. I have fellowship with them on a level that I'd never known before. They know for sure that Jesus is real. They know for sure that God has made provision for us when we get up against things. And then God gets the glory when he sends his angels to perform for us what we can't do. I ought to stop right here, but the biggest thing that, that I can tell you that's happened to me, in 1972, our annual meeting was in Espes Park, and we had a, uh, a meeting before breakfast, and I wasn't quite awake, and we were all sitting there, and we were electing officers. And so Norman Elliott was going off as ACR chairman, and he was conducting the meeting. And uh, so I thought, I wish they'd get this through and not have to go through this 
we had one man on the board. Bless him. He's, he's in heaven now. I don't know what they're doing with him. But, you know, everything that happened, he'd say, I rise to a point of order. <laughs> and it would just take us so long to get through. So, anyway, I was sitting there, and Norman, they voted, and he says, we have an election on the first ballot. And I thought, thank goodness. So he said, Thelma Lee, and I never, I want you to know, I just went into shock. I said, I've never been chairman of a local camp. I don't know anything about it. I can't type. And this has been brewing five years on the back burner, and I didn't plan it. I don't know what to do. You, if you miss God, I'm, and I went down to breakfast, and uh, and a priest prayed for me. I'd never seen him before, Episcopal priest. Somebody told him I was upset, and that was putting it mild. And he came and just he just uh, bent down on his knees, and he said, Thelma, I understand you upset. And I said, yes, I am. And I said, it's made me sick. I can't do it. And so he prayed for me. He said, yes, you can. You can do anything God puts on you to do. So I went back up to the dormitory, walked back up the building, and went to bed. It absolutely put me in the bed because I knew a little bit about what was going to happen. And it did happen. 690-something people, almost 700 people, and many of them from the world, or third world countries that had no dime to bring out. They couldn't bring 10 cents out. Ceylon, for instance, which is now Sri Lanka. And many of them. Now, there were some people from Australia, New Zealand, and, and parts of Africa that would pay their own way. We had to pay their fare before they could get their passport and return trip. We had to pay $70 a week board and room at Lake June, Alaska, North Carolina for each person there, those who were in that group, those groups. We had to use both the facilities on top of the hill and the one down under the hill, two different dining rooms, two different facilities, but all are in that Methodist campground. That's a gorgeous place. Well, Ruth Baird called me one day, and it was late in March, and this was to be about the 9th of, Ju of May, something like that, 8th or 9th of May. She said, Thelma, you better pray. I've just sent the last $4,000 overseas, and we don't have a dime in the treasury, and that's not a beginning. And we don't have any money. We expected 1,500 from one source that didn't come. We expected 1,000 from somewhere else that didn't come. You see, things don't happen like we dream. Gives God a chance to show himself mighty. He's a God mighty in battle, remember? Well, we were in a battle, a financial one. And I said, well, Ruth, I haven't got time to worry about the money. I had to write letters to all those people and invite them, and I was getting answers and doing all that. Had to hire a secretary and buy a, had to buy a typewriter. I never owned a typewriter. What would I have used for typewriter when I couldn't type? And so it was an expense. It was draining me of my energy. And then she tells me we don't have a dime. And it's about six weeks till this thing's supposed to happen. I, and so I said, Ruth, do you believe in angels? Now, she's in St. Paul, and I'm in Fort Worth. She said, yes, I do. I said, I'm going to send, I'm going to pray right now on the phone. And we're going to send God's angels out. And if they don't bring the money in, we won't have it. There's no way we can have it. We'll just call it off. I said, we didn't plan this, and I inherited the job that never had had a woman in chairman of ACR, and I always say, and they haven't had one since either. <laughs> so anyway, I prayed and sent God's angels out to bring into our treasury everything we needed to get those people there and to pay their room and board while they were there. This was, as I said, late in March sometime. About 10 days, I got an airmail letter, and in the first line, Ruth says, if you're not seated, get a chair. <laughs> well, I got a chair, and I opened the letter, and she said, Thelma, in my hands, I hold a check for $56,300 and something dollars and 86 cents from the estate of a certain woman in Rye, New York, that died, Rachel Johnson. Evelyn, you may have known her. And she said, it's made out to CFO, no strings attached. If, you, if I could have danced, I always, I still plan to learn to dance before I go to heaven. <laughs> but I wasn't allowed to dance when I was growing up. But if I could, I just jigged around in that kitchen. I want you to know, those angels were faithful. But not till I sent those angels out to bring that money in did we get it. We'd been praying. I didn't know we were in that bad of shape. But 
If you think that didn't make me believe in angels and that was before some of these other things happened, God had to start off in big stuff to show me that I was really stupid, that I had missed the boat and that there was help. And I want to tell you tonight, even though I'm keeping you past time, that God has angels at your disposal and mine. It is so wonderful to know that I'm not on my own. I tell you, you don't know what it means unless you were a widow or and, and you just had, you could see just this much coming in every month and it wasn't enough. And so it's just been wonderful. And then I told you God sends my clothes to me through these friends that have the good looking clothes in these shops. And I don't have to worry about clothes. I never had as many lovely clothes in all my life, but I've been sending those angels out and they got pretty good taste. <laughs> I have more to share and give to CFO and to uh, uh, CFOI. And the Lord raises them. By the time my honorariums get into my board, that's where they go for my travels. About every two years, I can go somewhere where there's third world country and where they can't pay for help and go and share the love of God and pay my own fare. That's what we have to do in CFOI. You have to pay your own fare. And, and they take care of you while they're there as they live. You, you, you live through it. I have. <laughs> But I've called out to those angels from airplanes, from one boat that I was in in Cebu. And I have, been, I have been so blessed to know that I've got thousands if I need them. As many angels as I need to get the job done, they are available. And if you've got some problems and finances, and I can tell you about some real estate that wouldn't sell and, and both things sold the same week in, in Georgia, and they had had multiple listings, radio spots, and everything else, and those houses wouldn't sold, and both couples were young and bought the second house before they sold the first one, and they were both in about to lose both, both houses. And we sent, one of them said, do you think there's any angels in real estate? I said, could be. <laughs> so we prayed, and we sent the angels out, and I went on up to Asbury College. It was with Tom Carew's group of students there, and a week and came back, both those houses had sold, and they had done everything. But we sent the angels out to bring buyers that would be happy in those houses and could afford it and that would fill their needs. You see, that's what you have to draw on. God is good. He's great. He's mighty. And I asked Wayne if he knew that song, Holy, Holy is what the angels sing. Anybody here know that? And I expect to help them make the courts of heaven ring. You, you can thank me for not trying to sing it, but <laughs> that's what the word. But when I sing redemption story, they will fold their wings, for angels never felt the joy that our salvation brings. So they're not deity, they're helpers, they're servants. And we're God's sons and daughters. The servant in the household is under subservience to the family to the children we're in their charge God gives his angels charge over us he said in Psalm well I've got to stop God bless you don't be afraid to send those angels out and uh, thank you Paul and be sure and thank them now I've never seen one I've seen them like this I, I, I just got to tell you one more thing. <laughs> Ed's going to be on me. But after I got my eyes open a little bit about angels, I'll tell you what happened in Mexico one day. I was speaking there, and there were several people there. One woman was there from New York, and she was on CFOI board. And so she met me in the hall up in the day sometime, and she said, Thelma, I want, well, come here, I want to tell you something. This is about 10 years after this incident in California happened. She said, I want to tell you what an unusual thing happened to me while you were speaking this morning. She said, I was sitting like here, and I was vision, uh, straight from my vision over here, catty-cornered, where it's uh, an empty chair or two. I said, I saw Jesus sitting in one of those chairs. 
And she said, you were speaking, and he'd hold up a cue card. <laughs> and you would, you, would re, you would say it, and he'd smile and lay it down, and he'd pick up another cue card. <laughs> and you'd read it, and he'd smile and lay it down. And she said that went on and on. And she said, I think that... And I hugged her neck. <laughs> I'd grown since then. I'd grown enough to receive that. That was the most beautiful thing. I said to her, I forgot her name. I said, oh, please pray I'll keep reading those cue cards right. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so happy. I'm so happy you let me come to Capon Springs. Oh, and I thank everyone of you. And it's been such a joy to be with Ruth and Wayne and everybody. <laughs> <laughs>